Instead of going through all the paperwork and legal implications associated with creating a foundation or endowment, many people these days take advantage of set a much simpler and less costly way to give to charities. They're called donor advised funds or DAFs for short. Not only can you take a fairly dedicated approach to philanthropy by setting up this type of a fund, but you can also work with an IFA wealth advisor to create an individually designed portfolio that grows in a tax-friendly manner, and one that's tailored to grow in a way that can work separately, but alongside your other IFA portfolios. To discuss exactly what a DAF can do for you and how they operate, we're fortunate to have with us today Kyle Casarino, a charitable planning consultant, vice president at Fidelity Charitable. Hi, Kyle. Thanks for joining us today. Hi there, Murray. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Let's start out with the basics. What exactly is a donor advice fund and how is it intended to be different than other forms of charitable giving? Mm -hmm. So really at, at a very high level, a donor advice fund is an account type that donors, whether those are individuals or companies, can use to separate the timing of their tax deduction with when they actually have to give the money out to charity, right? So they take the tax deduction when they put the money into the account, the assets inside the donor advice fund can grow tax-free. And then really at the donor's discretion, they're sending the funds out to their favorite charities really at their own pace. Okay. So it's kind of like having a big mutual fund or a big portfolio, and it can be designed along with uh, Fidelity, uh, Charitable, uh, working with an IFA advisor, and also uh, for full transparency, we also work with Charles Schwab and other independent uh, charitable organizations. But the point is, you can work with your advisor, use the same investment strategy, um, or one that fits your charitable giving as tailored by uh, IFA and uh, uh, donate to your different charities in a tax friendly way. Totally. I always like to tell folks that it's almost like a charitable wallet, right? So you put the money aside, you take the tax benefits right away, but then really the money in the account has to be used for nonprofit gifting. The great part is, is over time, hopefully the assets inside the account are growing tax-free. So the idea for a lot of donors is, hey, let's front load our giving, take the tax benefits in an organized way. But hey, if we're looking at this more longer term, hopefully we're giving out more to charity than if we just give the money out right away or uh, use cash, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit in a little bit. Yeah. And in most cases, the tax deduction amount that can be claimed is up to 60% of adjusted gross income for cash and as much as 30% for appreciated investments? So just to clarify, it's 100% tax deductible when you put funds into this account, okay. right? So the gift itself is 100% deductible, but donors can reduce their adjusted gross income, which is a combination of your earn, earned wages plus your capital gains by mm -hmm. up to 60% for gifts of cash and up to 30% for gifts of appreciated assets. The IRS also gives donors flexibility with a five-year carry forward. So if they ever exceed those limits in one year, they can roll forward the residuals to future years to maximize their deduction, all for a gift made maybe this year. Okay. And donations are allowed in several different forms, including non-public as well as publicly traded securities, real estate, private investments, and shares of mutual funds, correct? Totally. And the really interesting thing too, I mean, think I think it's so easy for people to give cash, right? I mean, I think that nonprofits have made it easy to going on their websites. You can write a check, you can use your credit card, you can even send a PayPal or a Venmo to a lot of charities, but cash is such an inefficient asset to give. If you think about what you have to do to actually give cash, you have to either earn it as income, pay income tax on it, or sell an appreciated asset and pay capital gains. A lot of the work that I focus on with donors and their advisors is how to maximize the tax benefits of giving. So the easy thing to think about is when you give to charity, you want to give the asset with the highest percentage growth in your portfolio, because that asset upon the sale will have the highest capital gains taxation, right? So it's that double tax benefit that a lot of donors utilize when they either fund the donor advised fund or charities directly give that asset with growth in it because the IRS incentivizes people to, right? They don't have to pay the capital gains tax on the growth and they get the fair market value tax deduction on the value of the gift when they fund the charity with it. So like a really easy example, Murray, is, you know, hey, let's say I bought $20,000 worth of Tesla five years ago. Now that $20,000 position is at 50. 
if I give that asset, it costs me $20,000 to take a $50,000 write-off, and I don't have to pay the capital gains tax on that $30,000 of growth. So, you know, it's a pretty easy concept to understand, but at the end of the day, those are the assets that are best to fund philanthropy with. Okay. And, and again, if you're using funds uh, instead of individual stocks, as we would recommend, then uh, the same uh, basic uh, tax principles uh, are in effect, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, also, it, how do you kind of parse who should use uh, DAFs versus uh, set up a full-fledged endowment or foundation? Uh, what do you find to be the differences there? Well, Murray, years ago, and I would say probably about 10, 15 years ago, if you were ever giving more than a million dollars to charity, it was almost a default, I'd open a foundation, right? Mm -hmm. So that certainly changed a lot over the years. And it, a lot has to do with what the donor's philanthropic intents have to be. Right. So if somebody wants to, let's say, run it like I always tell people is like, you know, hey, if you're opening a foundation, it's almost like you're running a charitable business. Right. Do you have events? Are you having dinners? Are you doing golf outings? Do you want to pay a staff? Do you want to use the money to pay for travel to site visits to different charities? Um, all of that is what you can do in a foundation that really doesn't come into play in the donor advised fund concept. But the dollar amount, I would say, is is something of the past. Right. So just to give you some perspective about what our demographics look like is um, our average account size is around two hundred thousand dollars. Our median account size is about twenty one thousand dollars. So about 60 percent of our accounts are actually under twenty five K. We also have about eighty five donors that have one hundred million dollars or more in their account. So, so it that's, really is yeah, a that's, that's a wide span. Totally. Yeah. So it's uh it's all over the map. And it has more to do with the philanthropic intent out of the uh with out of the vehicle, right? So if somebody just wants to give money to charity, outright giving, um, and that's really where the donor advised fund could make sense in in just about every dollar level. But if you're doing more creative gifting, setting up their individual scholarship funds that the maybe like you want to sponsor rather than do it through a charity, that's where foundations tend to make a little bit more sense. Yeah, I know it, it's pretty cost efficient too because I with Fidelity's charitable organizations as well as Schwab's, I know the annual fee is around zero point six zero percent for the first five hundred thousand, and. Mm. Both organizations tear down from there. And I think that's pretty representative of the uh, all the uh, donor advice fund organizations that IFA works with. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's uh, Schwab and Fidelity are certainly the lowest cost options in the industry. But if you think about what it costs to set up a foundation, right? So at a minimum, you're working with a tax exempt attorney to set set this up, get its own tax ID on the low end. That's a ten thousand dollar venture. Um, plus, you have to do an annual filing with an accountant with the foundation. The foundation has its own tax return. So um, that is another expense that comes into play. That 0.6% covers everything from the tax reporting. There's no setup cost to open a donor advised fund and all of the grants that you send out of the account. Yeah. Also, technically, the IRS will allow investors age 72 or older to use up to 100000 each year of their RMDs for charitable hmm. donations, correct? Totally. So that um, is an interesting concept. So what it's called is the qualified charitable distribution, where if you're age 73, actually, it's actually 70 and a half. So even the RMD age raised, uh, the age of qualified charitable distributions can still be 70 and a half. And how it works is that you can do up to $100,000 worth of tax free distributions if the funds go directly from the IRA account to a public charity. Now, that not only satisfies a portion of or the entirety of the RMD, but the individual doesn't have to realize that money as income, so they avoid paying income tax on it. Now, donor advised funds and private foundations, though, are excluded from that legislation, so the donor would have to give the funds directly from the IRA account to a qualified charity. Um, and what's very interesting is that this year, Secure Act 2.0 allows $50,000 to come from an IRA account and go directly to a charitable gift annuity or a charitable remainder trust that would allow the donor to get income from it as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Kyle. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Murray.